It's not required to be put on the label as containing MSG if it was created through the processing. That's why I, the Unblind My Mind is labeled or named as such with my organization because I felt completely blinded as to where is this MSG occurring in the food supply and it took a lot more detective work than scientific work at some point. Q Music. Places, everybody places. We're starting in three, two. Welcome to the Autoimmune Hour, where we look at the rise of autoimmune disorders. I've brought together top experts that range from doctors, specialists, nutritionists, researchers, and even those recovering from autoimmune to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information about autoimmunity and how to live your life uninterrupted. Thank you for joining us here on the Autoimmune Hour with Sharon Saylor. Always seek sound legal, medical, and or professional advice regarding any problems, conditions, and any of the recommendations you see, hear, or read here on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio. Join the Autoimmune Hour's Courage Club. Sign up now at understandingautoimmune.com. Now, back to your host, Sharon Saylor. Welcome, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm Sharon Saylor from SharonSaylor.com and, of course, from UnderstandingAutoimmune.com, where you can find, I think we're over 485 shows now, creeping in on 500 here. And I'm really excited because this is a topic that I've known about for a long time, and I've always wondered. I've never delved into the research. And you know what? I've tried to stay away from this topic for a long time (laughs) in my personal life. (laughs) And... When this book came across our desk here at understandingautoimmune.com, I said, absolutely. And the author's name is Katherine Reed, and she is a PhD, and she presents a really compelling scientific evidence-based information on MSG. Now, you're probably going, what is MSG? We're going to ask Katherine to explain it. I know it's a food additive, and I know I've tried to avoid it. (laughs) But that's it. And she has a brand new book out. Let me read the title to you so I get it correct. Fat, Stressed, and Sick, MSG, Processed Food, and America's Health Crisis. Also, let me read about Catherine here. She's a biochemist, and she is the founder of Unblind the Mind, Inc., and it's a nonprofit dedicated to improving health through informed food choices. And she has a background, as I said, as a biotech cancer pharmaceuticals and brings a wealth of scientific knowledge to working with chronically inflamed illnesses. And thank you so much, Catherine, because boy, chronic inflammatory illness is absolutely our thing here as autoimmune. I think that's kind yeah, of it really... part of the description. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you so much for having me on your show. Yeah. Inflammation is really at the root of so many diseases and illnesses. So it's got to be at the forefront talking about inflammation. Absolutely. And I think inflammation is often overlooked as even the precursor of oncoming bigger events, such as an autoimmune diagnosis, that inflammation starts out silently, at least in my case it did, and then a little bit of owie and a little bit of tenderness. And then like that story about the frog in the pot, you don't know you're being boiled until you are. So exactly. let's, <laughs> let's talk a little bit just in general about what inflammation does to the body. And then we'll get into why MSG and other processed foods. And obviously inflammation is part of our survival system where it serves a purpose is to activate our immune system to ward off whatever threat the body is perceiving a threat to survival. So whether we get hit by a rock and it's given us a gash on our arms, the inflammatory response is serving us to heal. It's when it's chronic inflammation where we really are not fighting off a real threat to the survival. It's just our body is perceiving that our sensory system is like regulated to feel like everything's a threat. And it's this chronic inflammatory condition that is absolutely energetically draining. And it does just then beget more vulnerability to other things. So you're having a hard time dealing with daily life activities and such. And inflammation acute can be good. Chronic is obviously just very taxing on the body. And I think the problem with chronic, as I said, it sometimes creeps up on us. We're putting up with little bits of new owies every day until all of a sudden it's a major event. 
So in my book, Fat, Stressed, Sick, MSG, Processed Foods, and America's Health Crisis, and this is way beyond just America, I really do go into the inflammation bucket, like you were talking about. Everybody's got some load of inflammation that they're dealing with their daily life activities and such. And so it's when that bucket is so full that our daily life activities become overwhelming because our bucket's full. We can't handle anymore. It's just tipping. And just waking up in the morning is an inflammatory response. And so that's when we really have to do something and kind of look at how to lower the inflammatory bucket, which I talk about how glutamate is activating and inflaming. And I'll talk about glutamate quite a bit, <laughs> but it's, it really is about how do we lower our inflammatory bucket? It's so fascinating to me because I travel a lot and processed foods in lots of locations are about all I can find. And so it's amazing to me how prevalent processed foods are. I get the convenience guys community. I get all of that. But we're going to hear from Catherine today about why processed foods aren't all that great. And especially, can you define what MSG is? I think many people are used to hearing that, but they don't really know why it is even put in food. Monosodium glutamate, I think a lot of people associate that with Chinese food and the, the accent seasoning where it's actually labeled as MSG. What I want to raise awareness to is the, the monosodium glutamate created through the manufacturing process, protein processing that I'll talk about in these highly ultra processed foods is actually creating MSG and it's not on the label. So people who are really knowing or trying to avoid MSG and they're just looking at labels for MSG, 90% of it's not labeled. And that's what I want to raise awareness to is how can the consumer empower themselves with this information to make healthier choices? And why is glutamate something that we should be aware of how much we're consuming? It is directly related to the inflammatory response. It is part of our survival response. It serves an evolutionarily conserved purpose when it's in mild amounts that our body might be secreting to run from the tiger. But if we're chronically in that running from the tiger response and eating and consuming a bunch of glutamate in our food, we're just exacerbating that fight, flight, fear, fawn, survival response. Glutamate is a beautiful, ubiquitous chemical in our own bodies that does activate our nervous system. It activates over 40% of our nervous system. It's a neurotransmitter. It's involved in a lot of metabolic functions, including like energy balance. And so it's critical to have glutamate in a balanced, when we need it, where we need it, how much we need it, controlled amount. What's happening is that the food industry has discovered that glutamate in food makes the food just taste wonderful. It doesn't have a taste in them of itself, but it's making the food taste wonderful. So it's literally addicting us to that food. The food manufacturers know that, but there's a bad rap on MSG. They're not revealing the processing that's creating MSG. Uh, my story starts out when my daughter was diagnosed with autism at the age of three. And as a biochemist, I was really just trying to figure out what could I do to help her as I'm going through the evaluation process, what were we going to do for helping her, the education process. And I was looking at her diet and I was like, her, her diet's horrible. She was extremely picky. It was just white, ultra processed food was the 99% of her food intake. And I thought one thing I could do is improve her diet, but she was extremely picky. If I put broccoli on that kid's plate, she would throw sometimes an hour tantrum. And so what I discovered is really, I had to take the foods out that she was extremely addicted to, bread, cheese, milk, the standard American fare, and remove the foods that she was addicted to, was literally hijacking her neurotransmitters or her taste receptors, and then start putting in and sneaking, what I call sneak attack, lots and lots of green leafy vegetables, and just really all whole foods. I got rid of the ultra processed foods. So initially I got rid of gluten and casein, which are classes of proteins that some parents in the autism world were saying were beneficial. And I saw some benefits and that really helped spearhead the journey, looking at what is gluten and casein proteins have? What's going on with the proteins? And that was where my protein chemistry background really just helped me. I looked at the gluten and casein class of proteins, the primary structure, it contained 25% glutamic acid or glutamate. And when you process those proteins through hydrolysis, 
fermentation, all of the widely used commercial processes, you start to degrade the protein and free the glutamate. Wow. So you can take gluten protein, hydrolyze it, meaning you add like some sort of high acid condition, for example, or ferment it, and you start to release glutamate as part of that process. That's how MSG used to be created commercially. So they know very well that you create glutamate or MSG through the protein processing. So when I'm trying to raise awareness to people, I'm like, don't just look at your label for monosodium glutamate. It's really the processing of proteins in our ultra processed foods. So in the book, I go through calculations of 90% of our intake of MSG is from ultra processed proteins. It's not the added ingredient, which comprises 10% in the modern diet. So that's really the purpose of the book is to raise awareness. It's activating our nervous system. It's trapping people in fight, flight, fear, fawn, survival, inflammatory responses. And many people have no idea they're consuming it. Wow. I, I'm stunned. I'm a little overwhelmed. <laughs> Really wanted to know this. Ask been, away. <laughs> I've been really careful to read labels, and if it did have MSG, et cetera, I just assumed it didn't have it. And this is really shocking to me that just the processing process creates this chemical compound, and they don't even have to put it on the label. Wow, that's surprising to me. I do have a tangential question, though. I keep hearing glutamate and all of these words, and I just want a little clarification about gluten. And if someone said they were was striving to be gluten-free, are glutamate and gluten related? So gluten is a class of proteins found in wheat, for example. A protein comprises of many amino acids. Amino acids are the building blocks of protein. And glutamate is an amino acid. So glutamate is a single building block in the proteins. What's good and informative about the gluten protein is it comprises 25% of this glutamate, right? So that's of 20 amino acids, 25% is the glutamate. So that's why they used to use gluten as the starting material, degrade the heck out of it to make glutamate, which is a byproduct or a single amino acid coming from the degradation of proteins. So for example, you can imagine like a long string of a complex carbohydrate with lots of different types of sugars. If you process that carbohydrate, you can get the glucose or fructose, the single subunit. The similarly with the proteins, you've got a bunch of amino acids. Glutamate is an amino acid. Wow. Okay. Now, I'm just going to go tangential a little bit more. <laughs> and I'm thinking about this idea of ultra processed foods. Now there are numerous ultra processed gluten-free foods out there where people think they're eating gluten-free or healthier, but are a lot of those gluten-free processed foods also inflammatory? That's what I really wanted to point out in the book is that when many people go gluten and casein free, so casein is the class of proteins found in dairy, they replace them with other processed foods, ultra processed right. soy or corn or whatnot. And that's what I really wanted to raise awareness of is that when you really want to lower your glutamate load, your MSG load, you really have to get off the processed food. So switching from gluten product to another ultra processed gluten-free product is not going to solve the problem with lowering your glutamate load. And the point that I'm making in the book with lots of research is if you want to lower your inflammatory bucket, you've got to get that glutamate load down, especially if you're dealing with a chronic inflammatory condition. So that's what I was noticing with my journey with my daughter and myself as we got rid of gluten and casein. And we were gone doing gluten-free breads and this gluten-free snack and this and that. And she improved significantly, but was still considered fairly moderate on the spectrum, special needs in special needs school and language impaired and, and so forth. It wasn't until I discovered the links with glutamate in the food supply and really trying to go wholeheartedly into mindfully removing glutamate from the diet by getting rid of ultra processed foods that I saw the absolute change in her complete cognitive language, 
disposition myself too. It was a complete change. So that's what I'm trying to raise awareness to. It's not just going gluten-free. It's not just going casein-free. It's going whole foods, not the whole food supermarket, but the, if you can right. pick up a head of cabbage and say, okay, I don't have to look at the ingredients here. It's organic cabbage and there's no mold on it. Check. Okay. Yeah. That's what I was saying. The way it comes out of the ground, <laughs> it's still in that condition yeah. when, you're, when you're beginning to eat it. Okay. Wow. This is fascinating. Cause I hear, and even my own hat, I'm hearing this. Yes, Sharon. And <laughs> how many times have you been traveling or whatever because I travel a lot for work I'm thinking oh my gosh I'm not bringing a whole head of cabbage on the plane right so yeah and I do have tricks for people when they're traveling or when they have kids and they're trying to go to birthday parties or social events because travel's tough and so I typically am making my own trail mix and bringing that with me I'll even bring a container of green beans or whatnot but I'm trying to get from door to door where I'm not having to subject myself to airplane food or whatnot. And then I scout out where are the local food markets or restaurants that I could potentially eat at before I land there so that I'm not having to go to some darn thing because I'm starving. That's a common tactic for a lot of us to do. Okay. Not only am I going there, but how am I going to really have a good time there? <laughs> but I'm curious now, I'm going to go a different direction because, okay, I'm on board that this is really important to know and it's really important to avoid however part of what i heard you say was going to whole foods like leafy green vegetables and cauliflower all of that totally on board with that but a lot of times i hear from other autoimmune advisor dietary advisors some people have to avoid lectins some people have to avoid oxalates some people have and the list goes on and on and so those are also naturally occurring in some leafy green vegetables and things like that oftentimes it's a conundrum for people with chronic conditions and chronic inflammatory conditions because they're like they're overloaded with what not to eat so they take out the glutamate the msg the processed foods and they take out the caseins okay that's the dairy and then all of a sudden someone says oh lectins or oxalates and it just becomes to me a slippery rabbit hole to where all of a sudden you're down to eating 10 foods no, and I try to avoid the, the limitation diet approach and try to keep as much variety in people's diets as possible. So I love looking at data. So I'm looking at whether or not there is a histamine elevation or oxalates. There's a, a couple urine tests that I think have a lot of artifacts with respect to how oxalates are being tested in the urine. And I think that's important because uh, I think the oxalate load can come in from vitamin C supplementation, from a yeast overgrowth. And those are the most common oxalate overloads, true oxalate overloads. But anytime I've had a client with a urine test that has been concerned about oxalate levels and it's showing up elevated on the urine test, I asked them to go get it retested because vitamin C oxidizes in your urine post urine collection. And it is a huge artifact. So a lot of people think they have oxalate overloads when in fact it's, it's a sample artifact test. And so the way to get rid of oxalate load or manage oxalate load is not eliminating your green leafies. And so there's maybe I have had maybe five people who have had true oxalate overloads, but I probably have had hundreds that have shown that on their urine test that it's overloaded. So first I just ask them if they're vitamin C supplementation, because again, that's going to oxidize in your body to oxalate. See if there's a yeast overgrowth because there's a yeast byproduct or end product of metabolism that will create oxalate. And those are the best ways to manage oxalate and not to take away your green leafy vegetables. The oxalate overloads are not really coming in from your foods. And that's a common misconception. So again, I like to work with people and find out the top three oxalate symptoms and if they have any of those. But like I said, most people will find, oh, I, I don't really have an oxalate problem. Histamine is another one because I do advocate like nuts and seeds. And so sometimes people who have elevated histamine levels, again, that is a very trigger happy inflammatory system that would cause the histamine levels to be elevated, part of our immune system. But glutamate can actually be co-elevated with histamine, right? So sometimes you can manage histamine levels by being more mindful of where 
the glutamate might be in the food supply. So I like to work with people and look at the data and, and kind of help them with their particular personalized approach. And that unblindmymind.org was a nonprofit I started to try to raise awareness of healthier eating, empowering people. But I also love to look at personal data and help people with their personal food journeys because it can get very personal. Like you said, this person's got this sensitivity to eggs or whatnot. So if that answers your question, so I'm a big advocate for leafy greens and will help people really truly understand if they do have an oxalate overload and suggest that they don't do something that is like a mass spec test on their oxalate measurements because there's an artifact going on there. Wow. I'm learning so much of the in-depth nitty gritty that nobody ever tells you. I can't tell you how many dietitians, nutritionists, et cetera, we've had it on or I've been to that it becomes uh, a little overwhelming for the lay person such as myself to um, understand all of this. And no one has ever talked about, is that just an artifact after it leaves your system? That's fascinating to me to understand that it's just multiple, more and more layers. And that's my training is I used to develop analytical methods and be in the quality control of biotechnology companies for manufacturing, commercializing drug products. And so I look at these companies and vet them and look at how they validated their test methods and such, because there is a lot of variability and depending on what type of tests and such. And so, yeah, and, and luckily I'm, I'm not advocating at all, prescribing medications or prescription drugs, I'm saying, okay, here's some good, healthy, whole foods and herbs that we can help with seeing if we can lower that inflammatory load. And anybody who I have that has an autoimmune condition, I'm all about how do we lower your inflammatory load? And that could be a very personal thing, even from more positive thinking and making sure you're not having stressful thoughts that are activating your inflammatory or increasing your inflammatory load. And I talk about that in the book, that even our own negative thoughts can release glutamate from our own system as part of the stress response and how much we can do with eating healthy foods and thinking better thoughts to lower our inflammatory load. And those are huge lifestyle changes in practice and Thinking better thoughts sounds easy, <laughs> but it takes practice. <laughs> yeah, it sounds easy. And I, I think we've had a few experts on that. This reminds me, very tangential to this, but the idea of thinking better thoughts. We've talked about the autonomic nervous system and how easily it can be activated, especially if you have a chronic long-term condition or an autoimmune diagnosis. And I'm thinking how this interplays and what fascinates me is my journey here, my 10 year journey on the autoimmune hour is how much this is one big puzzle. All these little pieces fit into each other as we begin to explore that changing one is helpful, but the more you continue to change and add on is extremely helpful, but you're right about positive thoughts. We have Sarah Payton on as well as Mikhail Giles, several others that talk about the idea of the body, the ANS needs to know it feels safe. And for us to have exactly. those positive thoughts and then understand, I think maybe your next book should be just like trauma induced food or food inducing trauma. <laughs> I, I do have that in there because, you know, when I was on the journey with my daughter, again, I think about autism and how we define it as neurodivergence. I honestly think the neurodivergent brain has excessive glutamate neurological signaling going on through their nervous system. They are wired to be thinking that the tiger is going to chase them, right? So they're, they're constantly on guard thinking the tiger is going to come out around the corner and, and whatnot. So they're more vulnerable to trauma. They're more vulnerable to our daily life activity stresses. So ultra important that they are constantly being reassured. I'm safe. I'm calm. And when I would see these accidental food exposures, whether she was going to a school or a birthday party and they accidentally fed her one of these, what I would call an infraction on her diet at that point, it looked like an induced trauma. It, her body would be shaking, her, like her little face would be shaking. It looked like trauma. So I think what you're saying is absolutely, you can have trauma induced by your foods and your negative thoughts 
And those are two things we can control. And that's where I'm like, I'm trying to empower the people because we have plenty of trauma coming in that's out of our control. <laughs> These I'm two so things, food and our thoughts are in our control. I'm thinking about my own children and one of them was a very picky eater as well. And I'm thinking, <laughs> I want to know how you were able to slowly and gently change the direction of the intake, the food intake and what was, because I'm thinking how much trauma that would have been in my household for this one particular picky eater in our family. I'm thinking that if we had asked them to change food, that would have been trauma inducing in and of itself. I like to work with families and figure out the dynamics and such. In my case, my daughter was three and a half at that time. She's Financially, she's on the payroll, she's not driving, she's not even on a bike. So things were within our control. So that made it easier with young and okay, I'm sorry, the bagel store closed down. There are no more bagels. It was easy to just be like whatever was coming in the house. So if I'm working with like the five to 10 year olds and they've already had the taste of the standard American diet, the SAD, I talk about it's your taste receptors are hijacked. They're just totally addicted to the standard American diet. So you almost have to take away the addictions and bring in the whole foods. So the analogy is to parents, I was like, would you continue to feed your children heroin if they were addicted and it would cause a, a trauma response to get them off the heroin? Or would you say, hey, continuing on with the heroin is not a good idea. It really is that addicting on our taste receptors and throughout our whole body. So I come up with an action plan to help. Now, teens can be definitely much more difficult with the rebellious stage, but it depends on how much that teen might be struggling with their state of health and how motivated they might be. Another motivator for teenagers is often their complexion. If they have a bunch of acne and they feel like changing their diet might help their complexion. So you try to find the motivator. Maybe they're in a sport after school and they're having a hard time with injuries or energy or something. So I try to find the motivator. There's definitely picky eaters out there, but I like until they're driving or bicycle or have their own payroll, you control what comes into the house and you can set the family value as this is what we're doing. And it's not just them. It's not just the child who's picky or the one that has the most severe illness. It's a family plan. So they don't feel singled out or missing out. And I just always impress them. this is the family value that and when they're on their own, they can decide what they want to purchase and such and how they feel. But hopefully you set the stage of how their body feels better when changing the diet. And that is going to be a great motivator. Although I can attest it how hard it is to give up those and <laughs> to get through that craving stage. <laughs> oh, yeah. For the longest yeah. time, I had certain what I'll call comfort foods. And even though I would be doing really well and then all of a sudden something would happen and I would just like, oh, th that comfort food just wouldn't leave my brain. <laughs> it was just seeing it. Right. Smell, even though and it wasn't there. <laughs> I honestly have a significant amount of clients with that comfort, like you're talking about, if we're trying to combat the survival response and like feeling like we need to run from the tiger or run and hide or whatnot, the comfort, it, it becomes almost a survival addiction is I feel more comfortable and therefore it's neutralizing this survival response that's out of control and not regulated and you can find yourself very addicted to those comfort foods from the survival response element. And I tell people like your taste receptors on your tongue are almost wired to being addicted to those foods, thinking it is helping you with survival. And so you really are rewiring your whole body to being like, no, broccoli is actually better for survival. <laughs> <laughs> Telling yourself broccoli, the kale this is going to help me survive. And obviously young children aren't thinking that way, but that's exactly what we're doing is neurologically rewiring the whole body, starting with the taste receptors and getting away from comfort food and thinking that's helping our survival. It's oh, a tough one. It is a tough one. My story is in my college years, I got addicted. I don't like to use brand names, but I got addicted to we'll just say to a very popular soda and just popping the can one day made me feel better. 
I hadn't even put it to my lips. And that was the moment when I noticed, okay, this is not about the sugar or whatever it is in that can. This was definitely an emotional thing is if you just hear that snap fizz and you feel better. I was able at that moment to put the can away, yeah. throw it away. Okay, this has gone way too far. And, it, and it's the pack. Packaging, right? People all of a sudden will get that comfort feeling from the packaging. And I have a lot of children where I'm like, say to the parents, take that, that packaging, dump out your processed fish sticks and replace it with your own homemade fish sticks that are maybe coated in ground up flax seeds and herbs and dissociate the packaging with the taste so that you can start to rewire ketchup. If they're addicted, dump out the ketchup, make your own ketchup so that we're breaking that that association. Yes. Talking about breaking, we need to take a quick commercial break and we'll be right back with Catherine Reed. And this is fantastic. I'm adding new layers of my learning here on nutrition and helping me think deeper about it because that's, you think you know it and then you're just completely surprised. So we'll be right back with Catherine Reed on some more information about her book called Fat, Stressed and Sick. And so we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone, to the Autoimmune Hour. I'm here with Catherine Reed. She's the author of this amazing, and now as I interview her, shocking book <laughs> called Fat, Stressed, and Sick, MSG, Processed Food in America's Health Crisis. Although I know I travel a lot, and I'm not sure if it's just America's health crisis. I think that I can think of other countries that have also a problem with uh, ultra-processed foods and the availability and what I'll call food deserts. I know even here in the States, when I travel a lot to certain locations, I am sometimes surprised that even in major metropolitan areas, how hard it is to find kinds of foods that you're advocating. Absolutely. I have clients from all over the world, and it really is a worldwide issue. And I think the more modern the diets are, the more ultra processed food that has creeped into the nation, their nation's and then, yeah, like within the United States, it's unbelievable. Some of these food deserts, unbelievable that they have to travel two hours to the nearest grocery store to find even what we're talking about with Whole Foods. Again, not the Whole Foods market necessarily, but just finding vegetables. Real foods. <laughs> the way it comes real out food, the ground foods. or the way nature made it. <laughs> That's the thing. Now, we've been talking mostly about vegetables. I just want to go a little tangential here. What about meat proteins? And I know you mentioned dairy and the casein things. Are we advocating here a strictly vegetarian type of diet, or do we bring in other proteins from other sources? Mainly my message is not having processed proteins, so getting rid of gluten and casein, because I do feel like they're, those proteins are pretty much always processed in the these modern diets even the milk is homogenized de fat and such like that where it's very, very difficult pasteurized to get unprocessed the whole food proteins would be nuts seeds whole grains when i'm talking about whole grains i'm not talking about rolled oats that's considered a processed grain but like oat groats or buckwheat groats and then animal proteins, again, where it's unadulterated, happy eggs or happy chickens before they lay their eggs or happy chickens that are pasture raised, organic farms, grass fed beef. So I'm not opposed to animal protein as long as it's not adulterated and processed. And that's a difficult one. In the oceans, wild caught. Again, I'm very mindful of the mercury or the heavy metal levels and such. I think that's part of the sourcing challenges, whether you're talking about vegetables or wild caught salmon, it really is like, where was it sourced? How was it stored even? Or what farm is it on? You know, it can be a little bit challenging and daunting, but at the end of the day, we have to eat. So yeah, the animal proteins I'm not opposed to, it just has to be not like bacon or salami or cured meats or anything like that, but whole meat cuts from grass-fed, pasture-raised or wild-caught. Okay. <laughs> and I'm just thinking of how many times that the way that it's worded on the package is very misleading. I don't want to go down that rabbit hole. I just wanted to state that, that I'm thinking a number of times that, especially the bigger words on the front of the package, and then you turn it over and you read and you see, oh, it's totally misleading. So I just feel yeah. like it's a yeah. game of gotcha with food processed foods. It's, 
I'm getting a little overwhelmed. Yeah, and, and, and that's kind of part of why I go into the book here. It's 90% of the MSG on the foods is not labeled, right? So that's just why. And with the FDA, and I know that the EU has their own regulations and such, but with the Federal Drug Administration, with the regulations, they're defining something that if I take, for example, the gluten protein and I'm processing the heck out of it and getting a bunch of MSG as the end product from that processing, the FDA is calling that natural because it started off with a natural protein. The processing is not at all required to be on the label. So you have this big gap in knowledge for the consumer of what the heck was done with it once you took the gluten and added it. And because it's considered a naturally occurring amino acid, the World Health Organization, we're talking about World Health Organization, does not require glutamate to be measured, the amounts put on the labels. It's not required to be put on the label as containing MSG if it was created through the processing. So it really, that's why I, the unblind my mind is labeled or named as such with my organization because I felt completely blinded as to where is this MSG occurring in the food supply. And it took a lot more detective work than scientific work at some point. And so that's really just my mission is to help and raise awareness with people and empowering them being like, yeah, these protein powders that people are putting into their smoothies and such, or these collagen peptides that will increase and be the rage, uh, the rave, they're processing those proteins. Beware. I hadn't even considered those. And it's funny that you bring that up. Years ago, I did have a popular protein powder that I thought I was being healthy, but I did notice over a period, it was several months before I really put two and two together. I wonder if it's my healthy drink that is making me feel so awful. And so this explains so much to me about what that was. And I guess I'm just surprised that here's another thing that is touted as being absolutely healthy, maybe you should check into it. Are there certain, is it just no to protein powders or are there certain things that we should check off our list? With the protein powders, I say to people, if you're going to make a healthy food drink, just add some nuts and seeds. There's your protein. You're not then questioning the process. And like I said, to the consumer, the process is you're blinded to it. You have no idea. So a, a protein powder company is going to have to differentiate themselves from this really good hemp seed protein powder, which is just ground hemp seed. They're going to have to differentiate themselves from this hydrolyzed whey protein, which ends up going into a lot of these protein powders. And so if they don't differentiate themselves with how non-degraded their protein is, you just can't tell as a consumer. So I'll go into some of the patents and actually look to see how they're processing the proteins. But if it says protein isolates or hydrolyzed proteins or anything whey protein already whey is a processed byproduct of cheese manufacturing so it's already a processed ingredient and so they're just trying to stick it into these protein powders because the dairy industry was getting on the cheese manufacturers for having too much waste and do something with the whey the whey is a waste product it suddenly entered our food supply as being a great protein source but they're processing it. So yeah, I had a client whose seizures were induced from the protein powders going into the smoothies. And this could be up to five grams of glutamate going on in these protein powders being adding to your breakfast drinks. Wow. Okay. Oh gosh, community. Yeah, as you can probably tell, I am uh, a little too stunned to really ask <laughs> important questions here because I, I am just thinking of all these things that we're told are healthy. As you explain them, I go, logically, that makes sense. But I never asked those deeper questions. And when you said going into the patents, I'm like, oh, my goodness, that is really getting down into the fine particular details that someone such as yourself would be able to understand. So I'm so glad that you have the new book out. And we only have about 13 minutes left, and I wanted to make sure that we had chance for you to talk some more about the READ, R-E-I-D, diet. I want to leave them, I want to leave myself, too, <laughs> feeling like I'm empowered to do something about this, because this is something that is so hidden and not talked about. The title of the book, Fat, Stressed, and Sick, really came from the 
epidemic, the, the health crisis that we have upon us here and epidemic proportions, but the obesity, a lot of people don't recognize that the glutamate is related to obesity. It's related to diabetes, this energy dysregulation going on from glutamate and its control over insulin secretion and how it's regulating our fat cells and such. There's just so much there that it relates to a lot of people, whether we're talking anxiety, autism, obesity, diabetes, cardiovascular. So it's trying to bring the reader to why you should be concerned and look at all these various diseases and chronic inflammatory conditions associated with with glutamate. Read, reduced excitatory inflammatory diet, is something that is really being mindful of this glutamate in the food supply and helping people raise awareness and empower themselves and really going all whole food. So the last chapter of the book really lays out steps for improving your diet. What do you do with your travel or your social situations that you can really keep on track and not fall off the wagon every time we have these very common life events and has some recipes in the back and really trying to reduce your inflammatory load. And what does excitatory mean? So reduce yes. excitatory <laughs> inflammatory diet. Excitatory refers to glutamate is activating or exciting your nervous system. So it's considered an excitatory neurotransmitter. So we want to reduce the excitation of our nervous system so that we are calm and comfortable and feeling peace and able to hit the joy and the happiness. When we're constantly in that excitatory state, it is running from the tiger. It is hiding under the desk. It is not wanting to go out social because you've got a migraine headache. Those are the excitatory symptoms that many people are dealing with that we're trying to reduce those excitatory symptoms. Inflammation, we talked about in the beginning also. So we're looking at how to reduce inflammation for the general population is mentioned in the book. And then I do like to do personal consultations so that I can look at people's data, think about their history, think about the family dynamics and come up with an action plan that really works for the individual or the family. And I, I enjoy doing that because there are some autoimmune. I mean, there's some really complex situations. And I would say autoimmune is one of the, the more complex situations. Autoimmune is very vague. There's many thousands and tens of thousands of different. And I am just fascinated with the immune system and its workings and how we can really work with each person's inflammatory or immune response and how we can reduce some of these symptoms that people experience with autoimmune. Somebody who's celiac may not be able to overcome the condition of never of being not able to eat gluten, but you can certainly lower your inflammatory load if you take out gluten and you are really lowering your inflammatory load and those antibodies can start to come down and your inflammatory load comes down. So I love working with the autoimmune population because there is a lot of data that you can do to help support the, the journey. One of the things about autoimmune is the number of diagnoses that they have. But I've noticed in all of my interviews that even with the same diagnosis, it presents itself very differently for each individual, which makes it very hard for not only the individual, but their providers of different healthcare options because I like to call it medical whack-a-mole. <laughs> Sometimes you're trying to reduce something right. over here, you introduce something and it causes something over there. And that's the part that just gets really crazy to me, really crazy making about this, what we do with our diet. So in closing, tell us where can we get your book and any final thoughts that you'd like to leave us with so we're able to empower ourselves and also tell us where your website is. Yeah, Fat, Stressed, and Sick, MSG Processed Foods in America's Health Crisis. You can purchase it on Amazon. That's probably the easiest place. Barnes and Nobles would be another place. And then, yeah, the nonprofit is unblindmymind.org. And there's more information on there, some videos, some lectures like this are posted on there, as well as an opportunity to book a personal consultation, if you, especially if you have data. I love reviewing data. And I'm approaching this very different from the MD world where they're looking at what prescription drug can they do, what diagnosis. I'm looking at how can I lower this person's inflammatory load and what would benefit them from food actions to help. So any autoimmune disease is typically increased inflammation. So it goes without saying that's 
part of the journey is to lower that inflammatory load, lower incidences of immune activation so that you're avoiding that immune dysregulated response potentially. So yeah, unblindmind.org and fat stressed and sick MSG processed foods in America's health crisis. And just leaving people with, wow, this is part of the journey is finding something new. Does that resonate with you? Is that something you feel like would benefit you or your family or a loved one that is suffering from chronic inflammatory conditions and it's eating good whole foods, real foods to trying it. Wow, that's fantastic. Thank you so much, Catherine, for sharing it with us. This is just been a bit overwhelming. I think we're going to have you back <laughs> once a community is able to digest all of this information because it's all of these hidden things. I just love it that we're unpeeling layers and layers of helping people find ways back to healthy and healthy living. And so the website is called unblindmymind.org and I'll have it over at understandingautoimmune.com, you guys. So if you are moving about and don't have any way to write that down, we'll have it over at understandingautoimmune.com. And that's Catherine Reed. Uh, thank you so much, Catherine. This has been awesome. And I uh, can't wait to uh, get more in depth in, with your book. And it's called Fat, Stress, and Sick, MSG, Processed Food, and America's Health Crisis. Uh, so all Thank my you so much. Yeah, I'm taking this a lot away, to, and I'm going to have to sit and digest this information a lot just to incorporate it all because you think you're doing the right thing and you find out new layers of all sorts of things going on. Everyone, have a great week. <laughs> just, uh, I'll say mull it over, okay? I'll be mulling it over too. And we'll have Catherine back once we formulate some better questions for her because- There you go. <laughs> Come hit me with the questions and I'd love to be back. And thank you so much for having me on your show. Yes, absolutely. And if you're here someplace watching it or listening to it on a place that you can put comments, put your comments below of what questions you'd Catherine to answer for us, because we're definitely going to have her back. This is just too much information in one show, I think. So everyone have a great week. We'll see you next week. Enjoy. The information provided on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, including the websites understandingautoimmune.com and lifeinterruptedradio.com, plus social media, is for educational purposes only. What you read, hear, and see on the Autoimmune Hour, Understanding Autoimmune, and Life Interrupted Radio, and its websites, and other media outlets is based on experience only. The information should never be used for any legal, diagnostic, or treatment purposes. 